Things were different back in the early days of professional basketball. Maybe because of how society is today, but it seems like we take ourselves very seriously. Basketball is the game and the game alone more often than not. Things were not this way in the mid-1900s. It seems like a lot of the time they cared more about the spectacle of the game than the game itself, and superstitions and odd traditions were rampant. While today the extent of non-basketball activities is extended to dancing cheerleaders and mascots on occasion, the ABA especially was definitely different. The ABA was about wild and weird things to cut against the norm and give basketball a new dynamic. The sport itself wasn't as popular back then as it is today, so they had to get a little creative to get fans in the doors. They had the red, white, and blue basketball. Everyone had giant afros. They were the ones to popularize the three-point line, so on and so forth. These are all things everyone knows, though. There was so much more depth to how wild these promos at games got. I mean, the Nuggets had a game where women wore halter tops and got in for free. Uh, the Miami Floridians had a group called the Ball Girls who were legitimately probably more popular than the team because they wore nearly no clothing. And of course the Indiana Pacers who had a bear that wrestled against professional wrestlers and fans alike. Like I said, things were different. This is how we arrive at our story for today. Along with weird traditions, the 1970s also loved superstitions and two of the biggest ABA teams, the Denver Nuggets and the Indiana Pacers, were two of the most over the top teams in the league. The Pacers kind of blazed the trail in this regard. We already established that they had fans fighting bears. Other than that though, they were known to break out all the tricks when it came to big games. They gave fans four leaf clovers and rabbit's feet in the stands for luck. They hung ladders over the walkway out of opposing team's locker room so they were forced to walk underneath it, amongst other things. The Pacers over the top nature is what led to the instigator of this whole thing that we're going to discuss today, Dancing Harry. Now when it comes to Dancing Harry, very few people, even Pacers fans who grew up in the modern day, have any idea who he is. Back in the 1970s though, he'd become a staple of the Pacers routine. So some backstory on him, Harry's real name was Marvin Cooper and he got his origin with the Washington Bullets. He got his job, coincidentally, by running into Earl Monroe at a pool hall and hustling him for courtside tickets. Harry was a very enthusiastic guy and often got up to dance during timeouts, so the players, who at this point he was actually pretty close with on a personal level, wanted him to do more than just dance. So with that, Harry decided what he was going to do was cast spells or hexes on the referee and opposing teams, and this became a huge hit with fans and his antics became somewhat of a show in itself for fans of the Bullets. He basically got traded with Earl Monroe to the Knicks, and through some convincing of upper management, continued his act there. The Knicks were where he really established himself to all circles of fans back in the day because the Knicks were one of the biggest brands in basketball and he worked alongside the players to really develop his character. Walt Frazier bought him clothes, he got endorsement deals, they really just overall embraced him as a franchise. He was never signed to any team though, so he was always fielding calls to make appearances and this is when the Pacers finally called. They were going into game six of a very intense and competitive series with the Spurs and the Pacers really wanted to win this game. They brought in Harry as the final cherry on top of methods to get the fans into the game, and it worked. The Pacers won 115-100 with an enormous performance from league MVP George McGinnis, who put up 32, 23, and 14 assists, and accompanied by 33 points from rookie Billy Knight, the Pacers pulled out the series behind a crazy crowd which was in no small part influenced by Harry. He is quoted as saying afterwards, it was so invigorating, when I came out on the court, there was so much electricity in the air. Everybody was used to seeing me in New York. I had the fans in the palm of my hand. It was so annoying to San Antonio. George told me later, man, you brought the house down. The fact that Harry drove such an electric crowd and the team performed so well in a series clinching finale was all that it took for fans of the Pacers to fall in love with Dance and Harry. There was really no other way to go. The Pacers were virtually forced to bring him back for the series coming up against the Denver Nuggets. Now. The Nuggets were a powerhouse at this time. They were coached by future Hall of Famer Larry Brown, and they had managed a monster regular season with a record of 65 and 19. The Pacers needed all the help they could get. So with that, the team flew Harry back on a private plane, bought him new gear, gave him a theme song, and they were ready to go at it with the Nuggets. 
The series was close from the jump, with the Nuggets winning the first and the Pacers winning two in a row following that, all games decided by less than seven points. However, the Nuggets pulled off a big away victory, 126 to 109, tying the series at two. This of course led to game five, where the battle of the spellcasters occurred. Now the Nuggets had been witnessing how effective it seemed to be for the Pacers to have a wizard on their sideline casting spells on opposing players. So they decided going back home to Denver, they needed all the supernatural boost they could get. So they hired a witch. Unlike Dancing Harry, who was quite infamous with a lot of material created about him over the years and plenty of info on his backstory, there was really minimal knowledge on where this witch that the Nuggets hired came from, which kind of lends to the mystery behind it all to begin with. There have been numerous writers, media members, so on and so forth from the Denver area that have tried to search her out and do a story on it, but it seems like there's basically no information on this woman at all that exists in circulation. Basically what we do know is what she looked like and the method she employed to curse the Pacers. So she basically started off the game standing behind the Pacers bench doing like the classic Spock hand gesture, wearing all black robes and had long blonde hair. From there, she proceeded to cast numerous spells on the Pacers from the bench to the pregame warmups. The biggest display she put on was at center court. She pulled out a massive witch's cauldron brought out a cardboard cutout of George McGinnis and proceeded to stick pins in it and cast more spells over the smoking cauldron. It was one of the more dedicated displays of witchcraftery that can possibly be dreamt of that would be necessary for an ABA basketball game. Now, of course, with all this effort, you would assume that the Nuggets would win. However, the Pacers and Dance and Harry were the ones victorious here, as they pretty much ran away with this one with a final score of 109 to 90. Did the spells slow down the primary target of the witch, George McGinnis? A big no there as well as he put up 33-7-4 in the victory and led the entire series in points, rebounds, and assists as the Pacers won the series in seven. So clearly the battle here was won by the Pacers, but who won the war? Well, it turns out the spells cast by the Nuggets Witch, who went by the interesting name of Rabada, the Wicked Witch of the West, weren't instant, but there was a delayed reaction here. Because though the Pacers prevailed in the series, they have been basically the definition of a cursed franchise ever since it ended. In the finals, they got slapped around by the Kentucky Colonels 4-1, and that same summer George McGinnis left to join the Philadelphia 76ers in the NBA. The Pacers were bad the year after without him, so the fans' interest waned, and even Dance and Harry couldn't will them to wins, so the interest in him died down as well. As a three-time ABA champion, the Pacers, after being cursed, have not won a championship since. With numerous competitive teams that have run into misfortune every time they begin to be competitive again. First with Reggie Miller teams in the 90s, whose misfortune was simply running into Michael Jordan. Then a very talented team in the mid-2000s that got shut down and dismantled by a brawl in Detroit. Then finally in the 2010s with a mixture of star player injuries and almost beating LeBron but not quite on at least three occasions. Will their next attempt at a run be more successful? I have no idea. They have young talent, but not nearly enough to say they'll be a surefire contender anytime soon. But Rabada the Witch clearly got the last laugh as her Denver Nuggets just pulled out a championship and could potentially go for another one next season. She played the long game when everyone else thought her spells were meant for that series. They were actually a long-term strategy that is just now coming to fruition. I just imagine she's chilling in her lair right now enjoying the Nuggets championship knowing she played a major part in it with no fans suspecting her whatsoever. So in the end, I found this to be a really fun and compelling story about the early history of basketball. Like I mentioned at the beginning, clearly the ABA was a different time in the game, and this certainly isn't the only story in the early days of basketball that is interesting. People talk about theories and gimmicks from the modern day all the time, but the early days was honestly a lot more wild than anything that happens today, this story being the perfect example of that. So with all that being said, I appreciate you guys watching. This is the first video in my weird NBA history series, and I had a lot of fun making it. So if you guys like this content, make sure to give it a like and subscribe. It always means a lot, and if there's good interest in this one, I plan on making more and more content like this. But with that, I will conclude this video. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Hey, thanks again for watching this video. If you like what you saw, go ahead and click on one of these videos here to see more.